Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Welcome to, well, an Airbnb in Boston. I'm in town because I'm having, you know, Thanksgiving dinner with the family. Haven't been able to produce too many videos, so this is my attempt. Uh, I have been producing content over on my Patreon. I've sort of decided that I want to start posting multiple times a week and I've been sort of taking as a prompt things that happened on this day in history. And one of the things that came up was November 25th. That was the anniversary of the third country to get a rocket into orbit. Now, everybody out there knows that the Soviet Union was first, the USA was second, but how many of you know which country managed to get third? Now, you might think it was the United Kingdom or Canada or Italy. These countries all had satellites in orbit, but they had to use American rockets. The third country to get a rocket into orbit with their own satellite was France. And they had a satellite, a spacecraft, a rocket called Diamant or Diamond. But France's like rocketry actually goes back to practically before World War II. They had uh, engineers working on uh, various liquid fueled rockets during that time. And in fact, some of the work continued even while France was occupied, uh, a scientist would be working in like French Algeria. Now, after the war, they, uh, they actually got a bunch of you know, blueprints and parts and stuff for the V2 rocket. They had got, got a number of scientists and they were planning something called the Super V2. It would be an intermediate range ballistic missile. And they were putting it together, the proposal, in like 1946, 1947. They actually acquired something like 75% of the parts required to make a V-2 rocket. But understandably, the USA and the Soviet Union weren't too interested in giving up the other 25% of, of the rocket. But yeah, they, so France would actually continue under its own means. Uh, there was a rocket early on called the EA. It was made with, it was flown using ethyl alcohol as its propellant. Um, and there was also the Aeoli, which uh, was launched in 1951. Again, ox, liquid oxygen, ethyl alcohol. Uh, but the one that I think stands out as interesting in terms of the sounding rockets is one called Veronique. Now, Veronique was a liquid fueled sounding rocket. It used nitric acid and kerosene. And initially it could launch payloads to like 65 kilometers. But then they came up with a modified, a bigger version uh, carried more propellant. They switched the propellant over to nitric acid and turpentine. Now that's an interesting combination. Turpentine, if you don't know, like you don't refine turpentine in a like a refinery from from gasoline or crude oil. No, you get turpentine by taking pine trees and scoring the barks and collecting the sap into buckets. Then that sap you heat up and you distill and these uh, volatile terpenes come off and that's what turpentine is. It's these uh, organic molecules and it makes a solvent which is highly flammable and that makes it an interesting rocket fuel. And by switching out, I think from kerosene to turpentine, uh, they actually got slightly better performance for their Veronique AGI and that was for the annual geophysical year, right? So that was their contribution. While you know, the Soviet Union was trying to launch something to space, into orbit, the US was doing the same thing. France was like, they were gonna go suborbital. So anyway, yeah, Veronique was cool. It did a bunch of different science experiments. It even launched biological payloads. Now, the, its payload wasn't too great. So they were mostly launching things like you know, rats and mice, but France does hold the honor of having launched the only space cat. So kitten space program, you know where it all started. That was a Felicette, I think was the, the name. So 1958, Charles de Gaulle, president of France or premier, I, I probably got this wrong. He, he basically says, look, we need an independent deterrent. We need our own real honest to God space launch vehicle. He was also eyeing like the possibility of ballistic missiles and nuclear deterrent because of course France had its own nuclear program as well. So they created a, an agency for space and they began working on a, an orbital launch vehicle and they did this one step at a time. So the final product would be the diamond, right? The diamond. But each stage in the development was also named after a precious stone. We had agate, topaz, emerald, or emerald, sapphire, and rubies, right? Sapphire and rubies. 
Uh, they, you know, these things would come with code names that were three digits, like the first digit would be how many stages, the second was how many, the type of fuel, and the third was the, whether it was guided. So the first one they tested, the first one they built in the early 60s was called Agate, and it was essentially a test platform for the avionics, nose cones, and things like this. Uh, it used uh, an NA801 solid rocket stage, which massed about two tons, and that would lift payloads up to like 20,000 feet, six kilometers. And so that was flown a bunch of times to make sure that their uh, avionics and guidance would actually work. Next step was Topaz. So Topaz was a large solid rocket motor. This was them scaling up. This is the kind of technology they would need to build ballistic missiles. Um, and the Topaz would become the second stage of the Diamant. So they would have the nose cone and hardware stuff already tested on Agate. Uh, the motor used a steel casing and the propellant was something called isolane, which as far as I understand it is uh, aluminized polyurethane and ammonium perchlorate. So it's very close to what we saw in the space shuttle. It had four nozzles on this stage, which it needed for guidance. And this was actually, I think it may be the first solid rocket motor with vectorable nozzles so it could steer. And with four nozzles that could steer on one axis, they could get full three axis control during ascent. So uh, yeah, this thing would, it, it would fly for like 45 seconds under power. It would, the initial version was like 2.9 tons and got 12 tons of thrust. The later version, the larger version, which was used was 3.4 tons and 15 tons of thrust. Okay, so the next part, is Rubis or Ruby. That was the upper stage engine. So this was a much smaller solid rocket motor. They actually still used the NA801 or Mammoth, by the way, which was used initially on the Agate, but they had a second stage engine that they were building. So this smaller motor, it was a composite glass fiber casing, which again, innovative in the world of solid rocket motors at the time. It still used the isolane propellant. Uh, it didn't have any thrust vectoring, so it would actually be spin stabilized at 270 RPM and it would burn for about 45 seconds. The whole thing massed about 750 kilograms and generated 5.5 tons of thrust. And you can tell that I am actually reading a lot of this stuff off a thing down here. <laughs> okay, so finally we get to the first stage and this ro test rocket is codenamed Emerald or Emerald. Uh, yeah, this was going to be a large liquid-fueled rocket stage. The engine it used was called Vexin. Uh, now again, it still used turpentine and nitric acid, which again, a pretty rare combination. Uh, the engine would be pressure-fed, so this stage was actually pretty solid because it needed to contain 20 atmospheres of pressure to feed the fuel into the engine. Um, the engine had thrust vectoring capabilities so they could steer it, so this would be launched with dummy upper stages uh, in this form, and they would demonstrate that the first stage worked. So now they start to bring it together. Sapphire, sapphire, that's where you take the emerald first stage and you put a second stage, topaz, on top of that. And then you have, you know, dummy objects on top. That performed a bunch of test flights. And finally, they added the ruby third stage engine and the nose cone, and they had the complete stack, and that would give them the Diamant name. And all that testing, did it pay off? Yes, Diamant 1A is 100% uh, successful for all four of its launches. That is pretty darn rare considering the amount of problems the US had with its various launch vehicles. So yeah, uh, this, you know, this is what testing got them. Diamant 1A was 19 meters tall, 62 feet, massed about 19, sorry, 18 tons. Like, now yeah, it would basically take off, you would have the first stage ascend, begin its gravity turn, Second stage would light up after 93 seconds uh, and it would fly for another 45. And then, having launched onto a fairly energetic ballistic arc to 500 kilometer apogee, the uh, second stage would remain attached to the, the first stage. Sorry, the second stage would remain attached to the third stage. It would adjust its attitude for orbital injection. And then, once in that attitude, it would spin itself up with gas jets, release the second stage, the, the final stage and the payload fairing, and then that would fire and perform the orbital insertion. So these satellites were inserted into a 500 kilometer orbit with the uh, apogee actually being much higher. So the whole orbital insertion would take about eight minutes, 
The first satellite for this launch was called Asterix, and I believe that is a reference to Asterix the Gaul, the, you know, the comic book cartoon. But given that the name also means little star in Greek, I think they might have used that to convince people one way. I think these young rocket scientists were probably all like, oh no, really it means little star in Greek. It's not about this comic book character we like, you know, because rocket scientists are nerds and we love them, right? So yeah, uh, Asterix would end up in a 500 kilometer by 1700 kilometer orbit, and it's not clear just how successful it was. Some sources say they lost contact with it like right away and it never sent any signals. Other sources say that it operated for 100 days, so I don't actually know the truth on that. But yeah, Diamant 1A was spectacularly successful for a first time rocket. It flew four times, all, to, all the payloads got into orbit, although the third flight the payload didn't get quite into as high orbit as they wanted, but nevertheless, early, early rocketry, it was great success. So it flew from like November 1965 to uh, final launch was February 1967, and then they had to develop Diamant 1B. They also had to find a new launch site. So as I said, France, third country to launch its own rockets into orbit, but they had to launch it from French Algeria. Um, and mid-60s, Algeria is getting its independence from France, and France agrees to take its missile bases that are dropping debris over the neighbours and move them somewhere else. The place they come up with is in French Guiana, Kourou, the current place where Ariane and you know, Vega and all that, they all launched from this site. That was, what, that was why they ended up there. So yeah, Diamant 1B, they took the opportunity to make it a bit bigger. First of all, they replaced that first stage that was burning turpentine and replaced it with a much more modern stage burning nitrogen tetroxide and a UDMH. The engine uh, is switched from being the Vexen to the Valois. And by the way, between Veronique, Vexen, Valois, you might notice a pattern. And this, yes, this pattern continues today where we have the Viking engine, the Vulcan engine, and the Vinci engine. Yes. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot more examples if you look at uh, Ariane's you know, space program. So uh, yeah, so the, what else did they do? They also changed the upper stage. I think they made it about 10% bigger. It became known as the dropped stage. And so they doubled the payload with this. It would launch five times starting in 1970 through 1973. And the first three launches were successful. The last two, not so successful. The final one was gonna launch a pair of satellites called Castor and Pollux. And it got into space and the fairing wouldn't come off. So yeah, Astra aren't the only people that do this. Uh, so yeah, the, the final version would be Diamant BP4, and that would replace the second stage with a new stage named Rita. And this stage was developed from something called the Mersol Ballistique Stratégique, or MSBS, which is a submarine launched ballistic missile system that was deployed by France in 1971. Again, you see the links between these programs. So the Rita stage was shorter and wider. It was the same width as the uh, first stage. So the rocket was you know, stubbier in some ways, but also much more bigger. So ultimately with the stretched first stage, the shortened second stage and the taller third stage, uh, it was Diamant, Diamant 1 BP4. It would be 22.7 meters tall, 20.3 metric tons, and again, an increase in payload capability into low Earth orbit. So this would launch three times, all in 1975 from Kourou, and that would be the end of the purely French launch vehicle program, because in the backdrop, there was the development of the Europa rocket. That was a deal between Britain, France, and Germany to build a three-stage rocket, which unfortunately, never succeeded. It was, it was hit by all sorts of technical problems and political problems, and yet it never succeeded. In the end, of course, it switched over. Ariane became the rocket, and uh, that became a much wider collaboration. It still involved all these partners, but in different roles. And so Ariane is now the launch vehicle which Europe has today. But yes, there you have it, the story of France's Diamant. Back in the days when France was seen as a plucky you know, newcomer that was you know, break, shake, shaking up the rocket world and doing cool things by being fast and agile. Funny how things have changed there. So I will be back on the West Coast in a couple of days. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.